to embrace plant-based lifestyles and ex as an expression of their faith. So that's concern for the environment, concern for their health, um, and concern for animals. Um, Jeffrey became vegan after studying what the Torah said about dietary choices, and he's excited also to be here today to present what he's, he knows about that. Um, all right, under Jeffrey's leadership, Jewish Veg has emerged as one of the fastest growing veg advocacy nonprofits in the nation. Um, Jeffrey actually came here today from Pittsburgh to present to us, so we're so thankful for that. Um, I know I'm, yeah! Hmm. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to, to hear his presentation. There's gonna be Q&A after. Um, so I know you guys are excited too, so without further ado, Jeffrey Cohen. Hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Galen. Um, before I get started, um, definitely a shout out to everybody you see in these yellow shirts from the Columbus Veg community who helped make today possible. So thank all of you. A special um, shout out to Kaylin who um, has worked with me to make this program possible today and whose vision it was to do this series on religion and veganism, which I can tell you is not happening in many cities around the country. And it's um, just so important because whether you're religious yourself, indifferent to religion, or even hostile to religion, the issue we're talking about is so important because the vegan animal rights movement will not get where it needs to go without the active participation of the re of religious communities. So I really commend Kaylin for recognizing that in organizing this series. Um, and also, it, it occurred to me, we should all be so grateful here in Columbus for Kaylin's um, passion and energy that she's devoting to this movement. And we should also be relieved, because if she was working for the meat industry, we'd be in big trouble. <laughs> so um, I wanted to say a few things about the presentation before we really get rolling here. Um, First of all, I, believe me, I recognize that anybody can take biblical verses out of context and twist them to support any cause or idea. Um, or cherry pick verses out of the Bible, take them out of context. We are not doing that. We are going to discuss anything, I'll answer any question. And everything you're hearing today, you're about to see, is what leading rabbis would tell you if they were here in my stead, and we'll be quoting some of these rabbis in just a minute. The, um, the other thing is, about an hour from now, you will know more about what the Bible says about animals and our diets than if you had gone to a rabbinic seminary or a Christian seminary to become a minister or a priest for three years. They do not get this type of training or education, and it's shocking because what we're talking about is not peripheral to the Bible. It's not some fringe idea. These are central biblical ethics that we're going to be discussing. Um, in our organization, Jewish Veg, um, as Caitlin mentioned, we're a national nonprofit organization. We are filling this void in the um, communal discourse. And it's kind of shocking that if we didn't exist, everything you're learning today would remain buried and in some cases intentionally suppressed. Um, in terms of Q&A, we will have time for Q&A afterwards, but as long as we don't get too far behind schedule, if you have a, a question pop up at any point during the presentation, please raise your hand, and we'll try to entertain questions as we go along, okay? Because obviously some of this material will be new to you. All right, so before we really get into it, I want to start with a joke. But this joke, I'm telling for a reason, because it really speaks to the mindset of the person or people who wrote the Bible. And I'll explain what I mean after you get the punchline. All right, so here's a joke. An orangutan walks into a bar. Has anyone heard this one before? All right, you're going to like this. So an orangutan walks into a bar, sits on a bar stool, and points at the beer tap. And the bartender thinks, this is terrible. Orangutans don't have money, but this orangutan's pretty big, and if I don't serve him, he could cause some trouble. So the bartender reluctantly pours the beer, gets, puts it down in front of the orangutan, and the orangutan casually sips the beer, 
And after he finishes, he kind of makes a motion like he wants a check. So the bartender gives him the check. And the orangutan, don't ask me where he got this, because as we all know, orangutans do not have pockets. But he whips out a $100 bill and puts it on the bar. And the bartender thinks, well, this is great. This is a stupid orangutan. He's giving me this $100 bill, and I'll give him like, the shiniest quarter in my cash register as change, and he'll think he's getting a great deal, a shabby piece of paper for a shiny coin. So the bartender does just that, takes the $100 bill, puts it in the cash register, looks through the quarters, finds the shiniest quarter, and gives it to the orangutan. So now the bartender's feeling pretty good about things and says to the orangutan, you know, we don't get many orangutans in this bar. And the orangutan looks at him and says, well, with the prices you charge, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <clears throat> so the reason I start with this joke is it really does go to the mindset of the author, authors of the Bible. As you're about to see, they had two ideas in mind. One, that human beings would have a tendency to disregard and diminish animals and think they're so stupid and so different from us. And secondly, they knew that human beings would also have a tendency to exploit animals. So they liberally sprinkled the Bible with instructions, mandates, verses to treat animals with compassion and to remind us that they're really not so different from ourselves. And you're about to see this. Okay, so, oops, there we go. So as I said, many leading rabbis would be telling you the exact same thing you're about to hear. These are just three. This is by no means even close to an exhaustive list. From your left to right, Jonathan Sachs, just retired as chief rabbi of Great Britain, is at least a vegetarian. I don't know if he's vegan. Rabbi David Rosen, he was a chief rabbi of Ireland. He is the rabbi today who meets with the Pope, the Dalai Lama. He represents a Jewish community at the highest level of interfaith relations. He's a passionate vegan for Jewish reasons. On the right, um, no longer with us, Rabbi Rav Cook, but he was the chief rabbi of pre-state Israel in the early 20th century and wrote a beautiful tractate, um, like a mini book, called The Vision of Vegetarianism in Peace. Before there were factory farms, Ralph Cook, he was the closest thing we had to a pope at the time. So I'm about to show you, um, you're about to see a six minute video we just put together um, a few months ago. The video is the video version of a rabbinic statement that's now been signed by close to 100 rabbis from all over the world urging Jews to transition to plant-based diets. So you're going to hear, hear from a few of these rabbis right now. The Garden of Eden, which was the ideal society, was a vegetarian society. Adam and Eve were vegans. If we take literally the vision of Yeshayahu of Isaiah, it's going to be a world in which there's not going to be any killing, and therefore it's going to be an ideal plant-based diet for humanity. It is a way of life that resonates with the most profound and the most sublime values of Jewish tradition. In the beginning, God says to the first people on earth, you see the seeds that are growing out of the ground? You see the beautiful, delicious fruits that are growing on the trees? These you may eat, period. God's dream really was Genesis, right? Where clearly Adam is, right, the first human being, so look, you eat all the grass, but there's no mention that animals are eating animals or, or humans are eating animals and so on. The 
language the Torah uses with regards to meat eating is concessionary language. If your hearts lust to eat meat, then this is the way to do it. Lust is not a terribly positive concept. God hopes that we, on our own, will evolve to a point where we will no longer, where we will realize that we no longer want to participate in this lustful behavior. Today there is for no longer any justification in killing animals in order to provide for our own nutrition and sustenance, which we can get today far better from other sources, because today there are other problems that relate to the Torah's injunctions concerning health. We are obliged to protect our health. This itself is a mitzvah. Almost all of the meat that we eat comes from animals who suffer either a little or a lot. And tsar ba'alei chayim, not causing pain to another living creature, is a central principle of the Jewish tradition. And we violate it every time we eat something that we know was factory farmed, was de-beaked, declawed, was, was treated cruelly. And if we're ingesting that, we're ingesting that suffering that pain, that horror, that what I've eaten, which becomes me, who I am, how can I possibly be at peace with myself? It's not a new idea that animals have feelings, right? That is a Torah idea, that uh, mother birds care for their young, that it's cruel to cook a kid in the milk that it should be drinking from its mother, that it's cruel to tear a limb from a living animal, that it's cruel to make an animal wait to eat when they see you eating because they might think, I'm not going to be fed. The animal is not kosher just because it dies as a kosher animal. It should be kosher because it also leaves a life that is a kosher life, that doesn't have any suffering in it. And modern day uh, uh, meat farms just don't, don't live up to that standard. If you understand in that way, you need to understand veganism or plant-based diet as the new kashrut. That is kashrut for the 21st century. Any other form of kashrut is problematic, highly problematic. So if you really want to be true to the, both the letter of the law and the spirit of the law of what kashrut is all about, then you should lead a life that is a plant that based on a plant-based diet. It's important to advocate for a plant-based diet in the, within the Jewish community because we are so far from fulfilling our duties and responsibilities about responsible living, especially toward the animals, that we have to bring out to the public a very somewhat radical idea, which is we shouldn't be eating animals in any form. So people think of gefilte fish as Jewish food, but it's really sort of Polish food modified. And the same thing with the dishes that come, for example, from the Iranian Jewish community, it's Persian Middle Eastern food. Jewish food is the food you grew up with. Noodle kugel feels, to me, very essential to my traditional Judaism, but now I make it with tofu. If you raise your children with a plant-based diet, in a generation, they'll look at tofu or at seitan and think, this is Jewish food. Okay, so basically all we're going to do in the next 45 minutes is um, peel back layers of the onion to explain why you just heard all these rabbis say what they said. And by the way, as I said, 
The video says 74, that was a few months ago. Now we're up to 100, and we haven't even really begun a concerted effort to recruit more rabbis to sign, so we'll be reissuing this statement soon. Okay, so a Jewish veg, we say that a vegan diet is a Jewish imperative. Where do we get the chutzpah, if you know that Yiddish word? Where do we get the, the guts to, to make that claim? It's based on three things. You saw this um, outline in the video. The first is that a plant-based diet is the ideal. The second it is we cannot say that meat eating is prohibited. However, we were only granted this permission at our, in our, at our lowest spiritual state, as you're about to see. And it's usually contextualized negatively. And then third, even if these other two things were not true, we are mandated by the Bible, by the Torah, to treat animals with exquisite compassion. Any one of these three things, and it's interesting how that kind of parallels secular veganism with animal compassion, health, and the environment, each of which is totally compelling on their own. Any of these three points by themselves is totally compelling. You put three of them, to, all three together, and you can see why we say confidently that this is a Jewish imperative. And by the way, mo almost everything you're going to hear today applies to Christianity as well. All right, so let's get going. Um, we start with this for two reasons. It's in the first chapter of the Bible, but also, if you only remember one thing you hear today, please make it this. The, this is the famous, or as I say, the infamous dominion verse, which is singularly the most misunderstood, misinterpreted verse in the entire Bible. We're going to see what it actually means. First of all, let me, let's point out the obvious thing. It's part of the same conversation. There are only three verses apart where God tells us you're only going to eat plants. There is no debate about what this means among any rabbi throughout history. So clearly, dominion did not give us the right to kill animals for food. Furthermore, it's part of the same verse, um, but Selim Elohim, we are made in the image of God. So what this is saying is you are to exercise your relationship with the animals is supposed to be like God's relationship with human beings. And in the, the biblical understanding, the chief attributes of God, of course, are mercy and compassion. And then finally, the actual Hebrew word for dominion in this verse is your due, which um, roughly translates as kingship. And kingship in the biblical understanding the first charge of a king is to care for the widow, the orphan, the most vulnerable in society. Not to be a tyrant or to exploit anyone. So I hope you're comfortable that dominion means the exact opposite of how people generally use it. And if you hear anybody say the animals were created for us to use, please correct them. Okay? Any questions about that? This, one more interesting thing about this verse. Again, this is the first conversation between God and human beings. And how perfect it was that you're enjoying Eden burgers because this conversation took place in the Garden of Eden. It's not a coincidence. They're called Eden burgers. This is understood by the rabbis to mean two things. One, it's an ethical injunction not to kill animals for food. But secondly, it's also just a biological statement of fact. This is part of the creation story from the sixth day of creation. We were created as, as, as herbivores. And this, it's so amazing that they knew this 3,000 years ago when this was written. They didn't have x-ray machines or MRIs or any of that. But now we know we have long intestinal tracts like our herbivorous animals. We have flat teeth like herbivorous animals. We were really created as herbivores. That's what this is saying. Okay, and furthermore, isn't it interesting that our closest evolutionary cousins 
are herbivorous, right? The primates. They don't eat, chimpanzees may be 5% of their diet in the wild will be from animals, but orangutans like the one in the bar, gorillas, all of the primates are vegan. Notice the resemblance, <laughs> can't miss it. Okay, so we saw what happened in the Garden of Eden. We don't know much in Judaism about the Messianic era. But what we do know primarily comes from the book of Isaiah. Again, common to Jews and Christians. Many of you might recognize a very famous verse. Even the animals, the carnivorous animals, will be eating plants. And why? Because the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. The, wait. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord because this is what God said. So we've covered the Garden of Eden, the Messianic era, now we're in this area in between. All right, so as I said, we're not going to dodge anything in the Bible, and feel free to bring up anything at all. Yes, question? All right, we're getting to that right now. Perfect, perfect timing. So this is Genesis 9. For the first thousand or so years of the biblical story, meat eating is prohibited. It wasn't until after the flood that me, when we were at our lowest spiritual state, because remember, the whole reason there was a flood was because human beings had become so evil. So when we were at our lowest spiritual state, we were given permission to eat meat. But you see the negative context that it's in. Not only the, the context of the flood, but we're told now the animals which were created to be friends and companions and helpers to Adam will now fear and dread you. And interestingly, if you go outside this library and encounter a wild animal, they, the wild animal will fear and dread you. Where it's worth, it's interesting. We also see, and this goes to um, your question, the first restriction. Only flesh with the life thereof. Um, you will not eat the blood is basically what that's saying. It's kind of old-fashioned English. So in other words, you see the first restriction, which foreshadows the kosher laws. The kosher laws are, as you may know, there are restrictions on consuming animal products. You can only eat certain kinds of animals. You can't eat meat and dairy together. And then the rabbis have piled on more restrictions. None of these restrictions apply to fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, beans, nuts, or seeds. Only when it comes to animal products do you see restrictions, which tells you right off this is, there's a moral problem with it. This is not the ideal. Yeah, I understand why you have that interpretation, but according to the rabbis, um, and again, in Judaism, we don't take, um, we view the Torah th as mediated through rabbinic interpretation. And according to, all I can share with you is mainstream consensus rabbinic interpretation. Even after the flood, we were still at, starting from ground zero spiritually. This was not a reward for, essentially, and also to reframe this. God, as we saw in Genesis 1.29, wanted everybody to consume a plant-based diet. Um, and he promised in Genesis 9 not to wipe out humanity again in a second flood. So to do that, God, in effect, had to lower the bar so as not to be provoked to inundate the earth again. All right, thanks. Good question. So we're still in Genesis 9. Interestingly, we're told in the same chapter that the divine covenant encompasses animals as well. So this is another indication of God's reluctance and disappointment in granting us the permission to eat meat. And what's particularly interesting about this, this verse that you see before you right now is repeated five times in Genesis 9. 
Very little, if anything, in the Bible is repeated five times. So this idea is, trying, is being pounded into our skull that God's concern extends to the animals and God has a relationship with the animals as well. Okay, we're going to fast forward a little bit. The story you're about to hear is one that you can go to church every Sunday for the rest of your life, or if you're Jewish, go to synagogue every Shabbat. And this does come up once a year. And your rabbi, your minister, will not want to talk about this unless they're already vegetarian or vegan. Very few people know this story from the Bible. And you're about to see why your clergy member might have been reluctant to talk about it. So, the Israelites, after escaping Egypt, were in the desert, right? So, hey, this is great for God. Now he's in charge of the, or he or she, I don't believe God has a gender, but God is in charge of the menu again, right? They, the Israelites in the desert don't have access to food. So, what does God do? The Israelites are given a diet of manna, which is described in the Bible as like coriander seed. So once again, God is putting them on a plant-based diet exclusively. There's no dispute about this. So what happened is after a little while, a subset of the Israelites start, went to Moses and said, this really blows. When we were slaves in Egypt, we might have been slaves, but we had meat. Now we're out here in the desert, and all we have is manna. Get us some meat, if you're such a great leader. So Moses goes to God, and I, hey, anything I'm telling you today, don't take my word for it. You can look it up at home or on your phone. You can always find a Bible anywhere now. All right? You're not going to believe this, but look it up, and, and you can satisfy yourself. Yes. The, they did eat meat in, in Egypt, but they had not received the Torah yet. They're, com they're coming to Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. So in this story, anyway, a group of Israelites um, petitioned Moses for meat. Moses turns to God. That's what it says in the Bible. Hey, God, um, these people want some meat, and what am I going to do? God says, no problem, got you covered. And this is literally what it says in the Bible. If they want meat, I will give them meat until it's coming out of their nostrils. It's a quote. So, next thing that happens, quail fall out of the sky onto the Israelite camp. And these meat-craving Israelites gorge themselves on the quail. Then, sh shortly thereafter, they die in a plague. And as if the message is not obvious enough, it says in the Bible, they were buried in Kibrot Hata'ava, the graves of gluttony. You're going to see this theme again and again that the Bible isn't just subtly making these points. It's trying to pound it into our thick skulls. So this word Ta'ava, remember that, because if you fast forward to Deuteronomy, the last of the five books of Moses, now the Israelites are just about to enter the land of Israel. Oops, that's not the one I wanted to show you. This one, okay. The Israelites are just about to enter the land of Israel. And they're getting their final marching orders. And God says, okay, when you're in Israel, you can eat of your flock according to your ta'ave. It's the same word that we saw here. Oops, wrong way. Ta'ave. Ta'ave. In other words, this means gluttony. So this is why, for instance, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, who was one of the greatest rabbis of the 20th century, essentially the founder of modern orthodoxy, said, yes, meat eating is legalized, but it is classified as ta'ave, lust, repulsive, and brutish. There is no justifiable reason why one life should fall prey to another. Why should a cunning intelligence that granted man dominion over his fellow animals also give him license to kill? 
Soloveitchik, one of the greatest rabbis. Also, interestingly, go back a second, same general part of the Bible where the Israelites are getting their marching orders, they're told about the food they will find in Israel. These are known as the Shabbat Hamanim, the seven sacred foods. They're all plant foods, right? Wheat, barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives, and date, honey is date syrup in this case, not bee honey. And you will not lack anything. It really, it, it's an echo of Genesis 1.29. And we know scientifically now, this is amazing to think about, every single nutrient that we need, down to the smallest micronutrient, comes from plants. Animals are just the intermediary. It all comes from plants. Somehow they knew this 3,000 years ago. You will eat plants and you will not lack anything. Okay. Another great rabbi, Yosef Albo, who's, um, hey, he has a Wikipedia page today. And he lived 700 years ago. He, his um, writing is still read today, especially in Orthodox circles. He wrote this in the 15th century, 400, 500 years before factory farming. Killing animals involves cruelty, anger, and rage, and it makes your soul thick, murky, and occluded. And we know, do we not, that in order to eat meat, you, out, you have to shut down your innate compassion for animals. You know, just to give you one example, and, you, and probably many of you can um, come up with similar examples from your own experience. I was at a, um, it was a retreat for Tu B'Shavad, a Jewish holiday, about a month ago, and there was going to be a demonstration of kosher slaughter. In this case, it was chickens. And two days before the slaughter, one of the organizers of the event got up before everybody and said, okay, the chickens are here, but don't get too attached to them because they're going to be shechted, slaughtered two days from now. Think about that. What the person is saying is, shut down your innate compassion, turn it off. Is that what we need in the world, to shut off our innate compassion? I think we need a lot more compassion. All right, so Sar Baalehaim, you saw this, a reference to this in the rabbinic statement video. This um, is the Torah mandate to treat animals with compassion. The Shulchan Aruch, which was written in the 17th century, is a um, important, um, um, an important compendium of Jewish law that uh, people still consult. And we see the definition of Sar Baalei Haim in the Shulchan Aruch. There is not only a prohibition of causing pain to animals, if you see an animal in pain, you have to relieve it whenever possible. So this does not come from the Shulchan Aruch. This is based on multiple verses in the Torah, a few of which we're going to look at right now. This is the big one, um, the foundational verse. If you're Jewish, you know that we read the Torah in a particular sequence um, each year, and this just came up in the Torah portion last week, actually. If, you, if you're coming down the path and you see your enemy, the guy who stole your girlfriend, who you loaned money to and never paid you back, and he lives next door and has loud parties until 3 a.m. every weekend, if that guy is coming down the path, and you see his donkey struggling, forget about how you feel about that guy, you have to help the donkey. That's why it says, you're obligated to relieve the animal suffering no matter what, even if it's not what you're, you'd really like to do. Here's another good one. This one, it's actually, you see this concept of the prevention of compassion for animals enshrined in the Ten Commandments. This is the definition of the Sabbath in the Bible. Even um, your animals are to be given the day off. This gets at the idea that animals and people are not all that dissimilar. Just as they are part of, animals are part of the divine covenant, they also, of course, they're going to get the Sabbath off, right?
This is one of my favorites from Deuteronomy. Now, why would there be space used in the Bible to talk about putting an ox and an ass, to, ass together on the same plow? Seems insignificant. What this is saying is we are obligated not only to treat animals with compassion with respect to their physical needs, but also their emotional needs. Because if you put the ox and the ass together, they're not going to get hurt, but they'll both be frustrated because one will be moving faster than the other. Similarly, there's another one with the same idea. As I said, these ideas are always repeated for emphasis. You cannot muzzle the ox when he's treading the corn. Now, what's the big deal? You're feeding the ox. The ox isn't going hungry. But even so, when the ox is out working for you, you can muzzle him because the ox will be frustrated. It has nothing to do with the ox's health. It's the ox's emotions that we're supposed to care about. The book of Proverbs, again, common to Jews and Christians, the very definition of a righteous person is how they treat animals. Of course, because animals are under our thumb, they're at our mercy, we can exploit them and the animals cannot um, post about it on Facebook or write a letter to the editor of the newspaper. They're utterly defenseless. So that's why the sages who wrote this determined that this was the best way to determine a righteous person. So, interestingly, um, this is Moses. It's not Charlton Heston. It is Moses. <laughs> there, um, you ever wondered why Moses was chosen for leadership? It's a very good question. He had a speech impediment. He stuttered. He didn't want to be a leader. But when Moses was a shepherd for his father-in-law, Jethro, one day um, a lamb wandered away from the flock and disappeared. And Moses went looking for the lamb, found the lamb, um, drinking water out of a muddy pool, looking tired, hungry, thirsty, and carried the lamb back to the flock, fed the lamb, watered the lamb, and on this basis of this one incident, God said, Moses is fit to be the leader of the Israelites. And this is in uh, a Midrash, which is a, a, a canonized, um, recognized um, commentary on the Torah. Shemos Ravah, chapter 2, verse 2 is a citation. And again, on this point, there is no dispute among any rabbi at any point in history, why Moses was chosen for leadership. And again, it goes back to, of course, because the definition of a holy, righteous person is how they treat animals. Kind of a similar story. This is um, Rebecca, another famous story from the Bible. This is not in Midrash. This is directly from the Bible itself. So um, uh, uh, they're looking for a husband, a wife for Isaac, and they meet Rebecca. And Rebecca gives water to the camels and the people who are scouting for a wife. And on that basis, the way she tended to cared for the animals, she was deemed worthy of being Isaac's wife, and is considered today one of the matriarchs of of our ancestry. So, interestingly, as we go along, um, this is from the book of Psalms, again, common to Jews and Christians. We see in here the idea that creation was not just for human beings. There are parts of the planet that were created specifically for the animals. I'll give you a second to read that. Can you see that in back? Is it big enough? Okay. Furthermore, we see in Psalms certainly that the animals have a soul in the biblical understanding. They also praise God. In fact, in Genesis, we see two interesting things beyond what you've already seen. 
One is that both human beings and animals alike are described as nefesh chaya, having a living soul. The term nefesh chaya is used to describe both. And interestingly, both are also described as basar, which means flesh. So again, the author or authors of the Torah are conveying the idea that we're not that different from the animals. They have a soul, we have a soul. You're made of flesh, they're made of flesh. Furthermore, again, this idea is being pounded into our brains. The very word for animals in Hebrew, in the Torah, and even in modern Hebrew, is ba'ale ha'im. Yaniv, back me up on this. That means owner of life. A ba'al can be an owner of a business, anything. In this case, owner of life. They are the owners. And this is why Soloveitchik, the rabbi you heard me quote a few minutes ago, also described eating meat as taking something that doesn't belong to us. We don't have a right to their lives, no matter what, even if we bred them. Once they're alive, they're ba'ale ha'im, owners of their lives. I mentioned that um, the primary attributes of God in both the Jewish and Christian understanding are mercy and compassion. And we're told this is Yevamot, part of the Talmud, which is, um, again, a um, canonized in, um, rabbinic um, amplification and expansion of what the Torah says. We are told that not just God, but the Jewish nation has three traits. We're compassionate, diffident, and kind. Three ways of saying the same thing. Anyone who is not, doesn't meet that definition, should not be considered Jewish. Of course, because we were supposedly made in the image of God, everybody. Up, oh, and there it is even more directly, another um, citation from the Talmud. Just as God is merciful, so shall you be merciful, of course. All right, so um, no one has asked about the sacrifices yet, so, but always comes up, so we'll get to it right now. So uh, interestingly, what it says here is that the only time you could kill an animal was for a, reli a religious sacrifice. There was no killing of animals for meat ever. In fact, if you did that, it is this, treated as a murder and the punishment is the same as murder, which is you shall be cut off from among your people. You will be exiled. If you kill an animal outside of the context of a religious sacrifice at the tabernacle, you are committing murder. Essentially, meat is murder. Interesting. And again, so you might ask, I'll preempt the question, well, why are the sacrifices even in the Bible? I'll tell you what my Moses Maimonides, who was a great Torah scholar from the 13th century, still widely read today. Maimonides, a lot of hospitals are named after Maimonides. He was a physician. Maimonides said the only reason the sacrifices are in the Bible is because at that time, in history, in that part of the world, there was no other form of religious worship. If you didn't have a provision for sacrifice, people didn't know how to worship God any other way. They would not have accepted the Torah. So there was a temporary provision for sacrifice. But we see later on in the, in, among the prophets, again, shared by Jews and Christians, the prophets railed against the sacrificial system in the strongest terms. Not what God wants. Does not want animal sacrifice. Wants you to be a good person. So we see it didn't take long, even while the temple was still around, that the prophets were saying this was just a temporary provision. We're supposed to wean ourselves off and find better ways of worshiping God. And in fact, you might have noticed, we haven't done animal sacrifice in 2,000 years. 
So kind of move beyond that. Um, back to Kesh Root. So this is Rabbi David Rosen again, former chief rabbi of Ireland, rabbi who meets with the Pope. What he's saying is today's concept of cash root, kosher, is per more, perme more permeated with crass indulgence and economic exploitation than the ennoblement of the human spirit. I think one of the things he had in mind, um, this might have escaped your attention, but does anyone know who the first person um, whose prison sentence President Trump commuted? Does anyone know who that was? Yes. Rubushkin, yeah. Yes, very good, thank you. Rabbi Sh um, Shlomo Rubushkin, who was the CEO of the largest kosher meat company in the world, called Agriprocessors in Postville, Iowa. He um, was sentenced to 27 years in federal prison, actually for financial crimes. But before they discovered those, PETA had gone in there with undercover investigators and discovered the way the cows were being slaughtered didn't resemble anyone's idea of kosher slaughter. It was horrific. Then a Jewish newspaper, The Forward, started poking around and found he was he, his slaughterhouse was largely um, populated with Guatemalan and other Mexican, Latin American undocumented immigrants who were being badly exploited, children forced to work till 11 o'clock at night, um, women pregnant, not allowed to have bathroom breaks, employees not be, being given proper safety equipment or training, all of this. So it actually, agri-processors became the site of the largest immigration raid in U.S. history. And the, well, back then it was the Immigration and Naturalization Service, shut the plant down. And then they found out he was committing financial crimes too and he was sentenced for 27 years in prison. That is crass, and that's economic exploitation, crass indulgence, yes. How does Kashrut come about? Apparently it was rabbis, the rabbis started Kashrut. Yeah, no, it's, um, we saw back in Genesis 9 the first restriction where you cannot consume the blood of the animal. It's pretty hard to do, actually, if you're eating meat. So we see the first restriction. Then Leviticus goes into further detail about what's kosher and what's not. The idea is that um, not only would there be restrictions to make meat eating difficult, that it would hopefully wean people off eating meat altogether because of the difficulty. Unfortunately, what has happened is that a whole industry sprung up um, in the modern era to provide kosher meat. So now it's relatively easy to get it. That wasn't the idea. It was supposed to be difficult because of all the restrictions. And in fact, our ancestors, up until about two generations ago, ate very little meat. How do they rationalize that it's something which is built from an animal in a humane way? Because at the time, these laws, the actual technical laws of kosher slaughter were written in about, the th about a thousand years ago. At the time, at the time, it was an advancement. It really was. I don't, look, we all know there is no such thing as humane killing. It's an oxymoron. But it was better than the way non-Jewish people were killing animals at the time. Now, that's, we have stunning, right? So now, um, animals are stunned, it's still highly problematic, believe me. But animals in a secular context are generally stunned before they're killed. Um, that didn't exist when these laws were written. So now it, you can, uh, we don't, at Jewish Veg, we don't take a side, we think it's all highly problematic. But you can argue one way or the other whether kosher slaughter is less worse or not. Yes. Yeah, that, um, we sometimes give whole presentations just about health, so I don't want to digress too much, but just to answer your question. The main, of course, as we saw in Genesis 129, we're created as herbivores, so therefore, of course, we're going to do better if we have a herbivorous diet. And the fact is, and the main takeaway is, if you look at the nutrition studies, 
that are, have the following um, criteria, attributes. They are long-term, as in decades. They are massive in scale, tens of thousands of people. And they're done by a highly credible research institution like Harvard or Oxford in England, where there is no industry money funding the research. When you use those criteria, you're down to four or five studies. Remarkably, all of these studies have come to the same finding, which is that vegetarians and vegans live longer and have lower rates of chronic disease, including especially breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancer, heart disease, of course. So yeah, the, um, there's really no debate about this. And if, to see doctors suggesting otherwise, if you think of that spiritually, if you're going to eat meat, not that I would suggest you do, why would you want to ingest um, the flesh of a killer? And then you cannot mix meat and dairy together. So like a cheeseburger would not be kosher. Okay, so this is a um, really amazing story I love sharing with people. This is uh, also from the Talmud. Um, you can look it up, Bava Metzia 85a. So as this story goes, uh, this isn't about the first century um, AD, after the destruction of the Second Temple, there was a great rabbi, also has a Wikipedia page today, Rabbi Judah Hanasi, who is famous even today for um, writing down and codifying the oral Torah. In other words, at Mount Sinai, when the Israelites were in the desert, as the story goes, there was the written Torah that we see on the Torah scroll today, but also Moses was told some other things. That's called the oral Torah, and in fact it was passed on from generation to generation orally for a thousand years or so. It was Rabbi Judah Hanasi, the greatest rabbi of his generation, who codified the oral Torah, wrote it down so that we could study it today and receive that wisdom, which we do. So the story goes, Rabbi Judah Hanasi was in his front yard one afternoon when a frightened calf, looking very much like this one, came running towards him and burrowed himself under the rabbi's robes. Well, Rabbi Judah Hanasi, codifier of the oral Torah, he's a pretty smart guy. He knew what was going on. The calf was being taken to the shoket, the slaughterer. So what did he do? Not what you might expect. He lifted up his robe, looked at the calf and said, this is why you were created. Go back to your owner which the calf, tears in his eyes, did and was taken to slaughter. Before the calf even got to the shoket, all of a sudden, Rabbi Judah Nasi develops an agonizing stomach ache and a toothache, headaches, and it's unrelenting. And again, tell me if you've heard me mention this before, as if it wasn't obvious enough what was going on. It actually says in Bava Metzia, that God and the ministering angels saw what Judah Hanasi did to the calf and said, well, if he's not going to be compassionate to that animal, we're not going to be compassionate to him. So this pain didn't just last a couple hours or one night. It went on for 13 years. And there's even a commentary on Bava Metzia, a rabbinic commentary that says the pain was so bad that soldiers not soldiers, sailors at sea could hear Rabbi Judah Hanasi groaning. So after 13 years of this chronic pain, one day his maid comes into his study and says, excuse me, Rabbi, a family of weasels has taken up residence in the guest bedroom. Should I shoo them away? And Rabbi Judah Hanasi said, no, just leave them be. And just like that, his pain disappeared for good. And again, if it isn't obvious enough what's going on, it says in Bava Metzia, God and the ministering angels saw that Rabbi Judah Hanasi was compassionate to these weasels, so we're going to be compassionate to him. So why is this story recorded for posterity in the Talmud? Because we are in this same situation three times a day or more. 
what we put in our shopping cart, what we order from the restaurant, we are faced with the same fork in the road. Do we make the compassionate choice or are we indifferent to animal suffering? That's why this is in here. All right, so um, any questions at this point? Yes. Yeah, essentially what you're reading in Leviticus is that if you're going to eat meat, you have to abide by these restrictions. However, and again, this was written 2,000 years ago, way before the onset of factory farming. In the, not only the, the cruelty of factory farming, but the scope, the incredible scope of it. The billions of animals trapped in this system. So that's why we say today, very, look, no rabbi will debate us on these issues. Many top rabbis actively support our organization, sign our statement, but no rabbi will debate us because clearly, as you have seen, it's a pretty obvious message that we're not supposed to be eating meat. And this from the get-go was supposed to be a, really a vegan religion. Yes? So why do you think so many rabbis do eat meat? <laughs> I'm going to speed through the next, there's actually a second presentation, which was going to be the original presentation today, called The Conspiracy of Religion. So, do we have time? Um, How much time do we have? That would be awesome. Okay, so I'm just going to go quickly, because this is a very good question. Um, so, uh, mind the gap, what we're seeing, and you're alluding to, there's a big gap between what even most rabbis and priests and ministers are doing and what it says in the Bible they're supposed to be teaching people about. So um, just yesterday I was speaking at um, Aguda Sahim, um, big conservative synagogue here in Columbus, and I told um, a friend of mine who arranged for me to speak there, I guarantee you the rabbi will have one of two reactions. He will either be nodding his head the whole time I'm talking, or he will look uncomfortable. But either way, it's for the same reason. Because everything we're sharing with the people at the synagogue is the truth. There's never any variation between, it's always one of these two reactions. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Um, I just have to note this. Um, I was talking about this with um, our future speaker, Madison, who's in the audience. Just last night, the, um, this was our Facebook meme after Pope Francis wrote this incredible encyclical, the, which is the most authoritative document a pope can produce. It was a couple years ago. If you read it online, La Dato Si, I think it's called, you will see he talks extensively about our relationship with animals. It's really beautiful, but stop short of talking about our food choices or farm animals. So we just wish he had just taken it one step further, but he did say every act of cruelty to an animal is contrary to human dignity. So what happened? Um, on the Christian side, the, everything you have heard is from what Christians re refer to as the Old Testament. Start, the five books of Moses, Proverbs, um, Psalms, not from the New Testament. The New Testament is not terribly helpful on this issue. So because the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, was, although it's part of the official Christian canon for sure, it's been somewhat de-emphasized while the New Testament is emphasized, a lot of these teachings have been suppressed. Same thing happened actually in Islam, which does recognize the authenticity of the Bible, the Bible story. On the Judaism side, this is interesting. After the destruction of the Second Temple 2,000 years ago, there was a debate among the rabbinic leadership at the time. There is no temple. The Romans just destroyed it. There is no place to do animal sacrifice. Therefore, based on what the rest of the Torah says, Meat eating should be prohibited, right? It's an obvious conclusion. However, 
There was another group of rabbis who said, yes, that is true. However, the Israelites are traumatized. Their temple has been destroyed. They have been exiled from Jerusalem. We can't pile on to their miseries. We have to allow some meat eating because they're, they're traumatized. So in that context, Jews were permitted to eat meat. Now, obviously, we're in a much different place today. But this debate that I just described to you is recorded in the Talmud. So we can read it today. Tzor Ba'alehaim, um, again, which is a core Torah mandate, core to, Ju to Jewish ethics, was de-emphasized in the Middle Ages because the Jews were persecuted, marginalized, they were having economic problems. The rabbis said, "Don't you can cut a few corners with Sar Bale Haim. Don't worry about it, and um, because we need to help you out." Kind of goes back to a statement. I think it might even come from the Talmud that says, "Where there is no bread, there is no Torah," which means if people do not feel they can meet their basic needs, they have a harder time living an ethical life. So, unfortunately, Sar Baile Haim has never fully recovered from that, which happened 700 years ago. You heard me allude to this. Just like in med school, generally doctors learn nothing about nutrition, which is absurd. The same is true in our religious seminaries, where our ministers are being trained. They don't learn anything you, you just learned. We've, we're actually, we um, were invited to give a, particip a um, presentation in a rabbinic seminary late last year, seminary, and we will, I'm sure, be going into other rabbinic seminaries because their own faculty are not teaching these core concepts, which are so relevant to our lives today. Um, then there's this idea that if it's kosher, it must be good, right? What people don't realize is that no kosher meat company raises its own animals for food. They buy their animals from the same factory farms that Oscar Mayer, Purdue, um, and all these other big meat companies get their meat from, get their animals from. They only own the animal at the door of the slaughterhouse. Yes? So I was wondering, if we must eat meat? Yeah, well, for, Yeah, here's the real, the rub, and really the reason so many rabbis signed this rabbinic statement. Even if in theory, and this is only in theory, that the slaughter was done in the most um, punctilious, um, the best way possible, even if that were so, and I'm not stipulating to that at all, even if that were so, you have the whole issue of how the animal was treated in his, in his or her life up to that point. And if Sar Bale Chaim is being violated, and of course it's being desecrated on these farms. If it's being violated, then how can it be kosher at all? Because in Judaism, another core concept, you cannot have a mitzvah, a good deed, enabled by an avera, a sin. If you have to commit a sin to do a good deed, you should not do the mitzvah, of course. So even if you consider kashrut a mitzvah, it's, it's a moot point because no animal can be kosher. If Sar Lehaim is being violated, which it is 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, other issues of why you still see, by the way, a disproportionate number of rabbis are vegetarian or vegan for Jewish reasons. But yeah, most are not, granted. You also have the issue of tradition, which has a vote in Judaism. So all these foods, which you heard Rabbi Wolpe say in the video, are not really Jewish foods, but they do have the weight of tradition. Corned beef, brisket. Um, it's from the movie Dumb and Dumber. We all know highly educated people do not know what's happening today in animal agriculture. And even rabbis and ministers are not well acquainted with what the Bible says about these issues. Then you have the issue, and everyone is susceptible to this, the meat industry spends $5 billion a year in America 
on marketing. And that's a conservative figure. It's probably more. And then animal products, of course, are everywhere, right? In our homes, our offices, even in our houses of worship. And members matter. Uh, if you saw the movie Cowspiracy, that's why it's called the Cowspiracy of Religion, you saw them expose environmental organizations that are not talking about the environmental degradation caused by animal agriculture because they don't want to alienate their own members. Well, um, clergy are facing the same problem, the same concern. They don't want to alienate people, so they're reluctant to talk from the pulpit about what the Bible says about these issues. And money matters. Uh, candidly, um, especially the Orthodox cash root establishment gets a fair sum of money for certifying kosher meat as kosher. So there's a financial transaction involved, and you can come to your own conclusions as to whether that presents a conflict of interest as to how they are interpreting the Bible. And then there's a demographic divide. Um, it's actually a pretty good-looking group here today, but they're generally our movement um, is made up of people uh, disproportionately who are not particularly religious. And then we can look in the mirror because very few of us were born vegan. You can, let me put it this way. I believe we're all born vegan, but we're indoctrinated by our parents and society that it's okay to kill animals. The, um, so we were not raised vegan. We made the transition at some point in life. So think back to why you were doing it. That would apply to your rabbi, your priest, or your pastor as well. So just to sum up, this is why it's important that we get religious institutions, religions as a whole involved. 73% of Americans still consider religion important. 90% believe in God. And religion is a main form of organization in society. This is what we do at Jewish Veg. We leverage relationships with these huge institutions. We have a vegan birthright trip. They take thousands of kids to Israel every year. We take them on a vegan trip. Hillel, they're right here at Ohio State. They're on thousands of college campuses. We set, give presentations at Hillel's. The religious world, especially the Jewish world, but the, also the Christian world, is highly organized. It's a way to reach people where they are. And there is a dynamic relationship in America between religion and society. They affect each other. So as we get Jews and Christians on board with this movement, that's going to affect even the non-religious society. And this is uh, just a quote from Professor Paul Waldau at um, Tufts University School of Medicine. Um, and he says it better than I could. Um, religions, the problem of the species line will not be solved in this century without religions being in the leadership. So, what can you do um, if you have the calling? You don't need to be an ordained minister or a rabbi. If you have this calling, if you recognize this, run with it. Write articles and letters for your church or synagogue newsletters. You have the Ohio Jewish newspaper here in Columbus. Organize screenings, arrange for speakers. Um, do, please go through our website. We'll go anywhere where there's at least 10 people. Um, to give presentations. Can be a Jewish venue or even a Christian venue. Bring delicious vegan food like we have today to events. So, uh, this seems a little self-serving, but I mean it. Support organizations that are working to change this. And that's the whole presentation. Thank you so much for your attention and your questions.